Hello, everybody. Last time I introduced the um, idea of the TCA cycle, tricarboxylic acid cycle, also known as the citric acid cycle, because citric acid is a tricarboxylic acid, as you'll see later today, also known as the Krebs cycle, named after Hans Krebs, um, who discovered it um, um, in the early part of the last century. The TCA cycle is the series of reactions that occurs in the mitochondrial matrix, and it allows the complete oxidation of two carbon units derived from many things, including pyruvate derived from, um, from glucose and glycolysis, and enables the complete oxidation of that carbon to CO2. Now, it's a cycle because those two carbon units from, uh, from pyruvate or other sources enter the cycle combined with four carbon oxaloacetate and combine to make six carbon citrate, hence the citric acid cycle or TCA cycle, that is then oxidized back to four carbon units, forming a cycle um, that uh, allows cells to release lots of energy, complete ox enables ultimately complete oxidation of glucose to CO2. We've talked many times how this releases energy. And it also generates lots of intermediates for the cell that it can be used to make other stuff. Last time I alluded to the fact that citrate can be used, say, to make fatty acids. Today, what I want to do is I want to dive into the details of how this TCA cycle occurs and the consequences of the way it works and how that affects other aspects of metabolism you'll see that it actually affects the ability of different organisms, whether or not they can make things from intermediates in this cycle um, because of how the cycle works. Now, now to start, of course, if we're going to start from pyruvate, Pyruvate, of course, has three carbons. And so if we're going to generate a two-carbon acetate group, we have to lose CO2. And as I described last a uh, couple lectures ago, acetate is also the thing that we can derive from metabolism of ethanol, showing us two things, metabolized glucose to pyruvate or ethanol itself can both be turned into acetate, but really the donor is this molecule, acetyl-CoA, which is basically also a carboxylic acid, but rather than being a carboxylic acid, instead makes this thioester bond, which activates this carbon as a leaving group such that it can combine with oxaloacetate which you'll remember from gluconeogenesis releasing that S-CoA molecule to generate six carbon citrate. This is citrate. You can see that we've made a bond from this uh, carbon on the acetate, losing this S-CoA group, to this carbon on oxaloacetate to make this six-carbon citrate molecule, which is a one, two, three, three carboxylic acid or tricarboxylic acid, hence the name citric acid cycle, tricarboxylic acid cycle. Now, these six carbons can then or this six carbon citrate molecule can then be oxidized, generating two CO2 molecules that are released and ultimately reforming oxaloacetate that can pick up another two carbon acetyl CoA to generate another citrate. And round and round the cycle goes, allowing in the end the net entry of 
two carbons effectively from acetate and release of two carbons as CO2. Now, as I alluded to, this can come from pyruvate. It can come from acetate itself, vinegar. It can come from alcohol. It turns out that when you break down fat, you also break it into two carbon units. And so this cycle becomes very useful for cells because it allows the oxidation of many different molecules to completely turn that carbon into CO2. Now, if we're going to do this from glucose, however, you'll remember that pyruvate has three carbons. And so if we're going to turn pyruvate into acetate or acetyl-CoA, we have to lose a carbon of CO2. Right? We have to lose this carbon as CO2. Now, we saw this before, that we can do this via, um, this is exactly how we, uh, we uh, generated um, um, ethanol when we did fermentation um, in to, of, of pyruvate to, to ethanol. But that molecule didn't generate acetate. It generated acetaldehyde, difference, of course, being whether or not this carbon gets oxidized in the case of acetate to the acid or an acetaldehyde and ethanol metabolism where it re remains an aldehyde. Now, obviously, you can make ethanol and then turn that ethanol into acetate, and that's a pathway that I guess certainly would work. However, that's not the way it happens in most organisms. Most organisms actually directly produce acetate, or more correctly, acetyl-CoA from pyruvate. So let's take a look at that reaction. So here, once again, is pyruvate. And if we turn that pyruvate into this two-carbon acetyl-CoA, let's look here what has to happen. Well, the first thing is, is that we have to decarboxylate this molecule. And so that generates a CO2. Okay, we have to lose that one carbon. All right. Also, as I pointed out, this, if we do this as if we did it in ethanol metabolism, we'd be left with an aldehyde. But this is an acid. And so this carbon also has to be oxidized. We know how to do that. We can donate those electrons to something like. NAD, so the NAD is reduced to NADH. And we had to add this S-CoA molecule, which I'll come to in a minute. And so each of these steps um, ends up making a fairly complicated reaction. Obviously, several cofactors are going to be involved. You should be able to guess that just by looking at it. Obviously, I already drew up their NAD. If we're going to decarboxylate, remember this is a alpha carboxylic, uh, uh, an alpha keto acid. The ketone group is alpha to the carboxylic acid. And so if we're doing alpha decarboxylation, as you might guess, we need a cofactor. That cofactor, as I told you before, is a cofactor of thiamine pyrophosphate. And finally, there's this S-CoA group. We need to describe what that is. However, before delving into those, and there's actually a couple other cofactors that are needed as well, I want to mention one other issue about this reaction, and that this reaction happens in the mitochondria, um, because that's also where the TCA cycle happens. So recall that if we divide the cell into two compartments, like an eukaryotic cell, here we have the cytosol and the mitochondria in a eukaryotic cell. As we've already talked about, having different compartments helps facilitate different metabolic reactions, because you can have different conditions in the two compartments. And so, as we said, glycolysis, 
occurs in the cytosol, glucose to pyruvate. And last time I mentioned the TCA cycle, okay, occurs in the mitochondria. And so that means if we're going to fully oxidize the pyruvate carbon to CO2 using the TCA cycle in the mitochondria, that pyruvate has to get from the cytosol to the mitochondria, or at least carbons from the pyruvate have to get there. It turns out, you'll see in a minute, acetyl-CoA is a very large group. And so pyruvate itself is transported into the mitochondria. And that's where the reaction occurs to turn it into acetyl-CoA that can then enter the TCA cycle and oxidize it. However, what this means is, is that a transporter is actually needed to get this across the mitochondrial membranes and into the matrix of the mitochondria where the TCA cycle happens. And I like to mention this because it turns out the pyruvate carrier, that is the transporter, the way that it actually gets that pyruvate from the cytosol into the mitochondria, actually was an unknown thing about metabolism until 2012, so not that long ago. Sometimes one can be left with the feeling listening to these metabolism classes or reading a textbook that everything about metabolism has been known forever, but it's actually not true. Here's a very key central part of the pathway that was actually just discovered, um, at least at the time of this lecture, less than 10 years ago. All right. It also illustrates that not all metabolism is completely understood. Now, now let's get back to this reaction, how you turn pyruvate into acetyl-CoA. And I want to go through now and point out that several cofactors are needed. And so I already mentioned one of them, S-CoA, which is shorthand for coenzyme A. And so I need to tell you what that is. You hopefully are already familiar with TPP plus, thymine pyrophosphate. We talked about that um, um, when we talked about how you do alpha decarboxylation to generate ethanol from pyruvate, also used here for the alpha decarboxylation reaction. Redox reaction happens, and so we needed NAD plus to get converted into NADH. We talked a lot about how that serves as an electron carrier, but it turns out that there's two additional electron carriers that are involved in this reaction. One of them is called FAD, and the other one is called lipoic acid. Now you might say, why do we need all these electron carriers? Well, these are just different molecules that can carry two um, two electrons, similar to NADH. And effectively, what these can do by having multiple electron carriers, one can build chains of oxidation and reduction reactions. And it turns out these chains of oxidation and reduction reactions really become central to energy transfers in biology, because building these chains allows more easy stepwise release of energy as one moves across these oxidation reduction reactions, which remember, as I alluded to earlier, really are at the core of bioenergetics and a lot of what, um, what allows energy release from these pathways. What I mean by this will be more um, explicit as we go through what some of these cofactors look like. Okay, so I'm not gonna draw TPP plus or NAD again, but let's define what some of these other cofactors look like. So let's start with coenzyme A. So coenzyme A, it turns out, is a useful, it's actually involved in lots of acylation reactions. What's an acylation reaction? Well, that's basically if you're making a carbon-carbon bond from by adding a molecule of greater than one carbon, so two carbons are greater, to something else. That's an acylation reaction, as we did with adding the two carbon acetate to oxaloacetate to make citrate. And you'll actually see coenzyme A will come up in this in many, many lectures throughout the rest of the course. 
why this becomes useful is because it activates this basically um, carbon to the left of the, of, 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 in this case, the ketone, because by having that thioester there ends up activating that carbon um, and allows it to carry out these acylation reactions. Coenzyme A itself is derived from a vitamin called pantothenic acid. And as a vitamin, this is uh, something that you have to get from the diet. Now, when we abbreviate coenzyme A, which is often abbreviated S-CoA, you get the sense that it's this little tiny molecule that's just stuck on, you know, sulfur stuck on to the end to make this thioester bond. But it turns out coenzyme A is actually a giant molecule, one of the reasons why you actually uh, put it, uh, uh, synthesize acetyl-CoA in the mitochondria because it's hard to transport this giant molecule. And so this is what pantothenic acid looks like. Okay, so if I put an acid group here and a hydroxyl group there, that would be pantothenic acid, the thing that's in your um, cereal, on the side of your cereal box. And then there's these additional pieces. This is the active end of the molecule. That's that sulfur from the S-CoA. And then this side of the molecule is esterified to two phosphates, which are esterified to, I'm not going to draw it out, but this would have an adenine base and a phosphate there. So basically, this is ADP with a three prime, um, with, with a phosphate added to the three prime position of the ADP molecule added to pantothenic acid, added to this short chain with a sulfur on the end, and this whole molecule together is coenzyme A. And so when we say acetyl-CoA, it's this giant molecule, S thioester to the, um, you know, to, 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 to the carbonyl, the acid on, on acetate to, um, to CH3. And so that would be basically acetyl-CoA. And so, one convenient thing about this is it's much easier than drawing that big molecule, but it is a little bit misleading um, in terms of its size. Okay, so that's coenzyme A. Next one I want to talk about is FAD, which stands for flavin adenine di nucleotide. So flavin adenine dinucleotide is an electron carrier just like NAD+. And it's derived from the vitamin riboflavin, also referred to as vitamin B2. Um, another thing from the side of your cereal box. And basically, looks like this. And so, like NAD, it's a dinucleotide. Okay, and so here's ADP, just like we drew for CoA, or just like one end of NAD. One difference is, is that the other nucleotide down here actually isn't technically a sugar. It's ribitol instead of ribose. What does that mean? It doesn't have an aldehyde. Instead, it is just a five carbon chain where all of the carbons are alcohols. 
And so since there's no aldehyde, it doesn't form a ring. And the base on this end, as a nicotinamide, is this flavin group. Which looks like this. And so this is FAD, which is in the oxidized form. Turns out in the oxidized form, FAD is yellow, hence riboflavin, flavin, yellow. And the reason it's yellow, you see there's a conjugated double bond here across this part. It turns out this is the active part of the molecule, and it works as follows. And so if you have a hydride ion, remember the way we can transfer two electrons. can transfer the two electrons that way, and that allows it to generate, and I'll just draw the middle here, active part of the molecule. Okay, so that would be these two nitrogens. We've added two electrons to it, and so this is abbreviated FADH2, or the reduced form of FAD, and it is colorless. Because now you no longer have that conjugated double bond system, loses its color. And so you can follow whether FAD is oxidized or reduced by just looking at color change. All right, so that's FAD. It's a Electron carrier carries electrons by a hydride transfer, very similarly to what we described for NAD, but obviously a different molecule. All right, and then the last molecule, the last cofactor that we need for this reaction is lipoic acid, which unlike most things in metabolism doesn't have an abbreviation. Um, and also functions as an electron carrier. And so lipoic acid looks like this. Okay, so that is lipoic acid. This is in the oxidized form. And so where it's oxidized is here at this sulfur-sulfur bond. So you can think of this as like the same as a disulfide bond that you learned about from Professor Yaffe in proteins. And so this is the oxidized form of the disulfide bond. If I take this hydride, transfer two electrons across that bond, then it goes to, and I'll just draw here the active end. Then we go here to the reduced form of lipoic acid, and there's no abbreviation for oxidized or reduced lipoic acid. It's just lipoic acid oxidized, lipoic acid reduced, and how they're oxidized and reduced is basically very similar to the disulfide bonds um, that you saw in, in proteins being oxidized, disulfide bond being oxidized or can be reduced to not be a disulfide bond. All right, now it turns out that these cofactors are TBP, FAD, and lipoic acid are all stably associated with different subunits of a multi-protein complex 
that assembles to catalyze that reaction to convert pyruvate to acetyl-CoA. The enzyme or enzyme complex that carries this out is referred to as PDH, sometimes abbreviated PDC, which stands for the pyruvate dehydrogenase complex, so pyruvate dehydrogenase, PDH, pyruvate dehydrogenase complex, PDC. This complex is basically three different polypeptides that come together to form a complex and catalyze that reaction. Now, where this complex sits, so if this is the mitochondria, this is the matrix, that's where this pyruvate dehydrogenase reaction occurs, that's where the, the TCA cycle occurs. And this PDH complex is basically sitting here at the membrane on the matrix side of, of the membrane. Now, the three different polypeptides that come together to form this complex are creatively named E1, E2, and E3 for enzyme 1, 2, and 3. And each of these, as I alluded to, is associated with a different cofactor. And so E1 is associated with thiamine pyrophosphate. E2 is associated with lipoic acid. And E3 is associated with FAD. OK, so now let's go through the mechanism for how this pyruvate dehydrogenase reaction works. Remember, this is the active part of TBP+. It is bound in the active site of enzyme 1, and it reacts with pyruvate to catalyze alpha decarboxylation, just like we described for conversion of pyruvate to alcohol. So you're going to see exactly the same mechanism that we drew before. So that decarboxylates the alpha keto acid, just like we saw to generate acetaldehyde. The difference is, is rather than resolve this such that this carbon has the same oxidation state and make acetaldehyde, instead, the next step of this reaction is going to be oxidized by reducing lipoic acid, so the active part of lipoic acid that is in the active site of enzyme of the E2 subunit. 
Okay, so this will now regenerate E1, but what we're left with then is this, now bound, this intermediate bound to E2. Here's where coenzyme A can come in, which will then generate acetyl-CoA. But now we are left with E2 in the reduced state rather than being in the oxidized state. So E2 has to be reoxidized in order for this complex to carry out the next catalytic cycle. And the way that works is as follows. So you have FAD bound on E3. And so have a hydride ion from the oxidation of E3. That can be transferred to FAD. That will generate FAD from the oxidized to the reduced form. Okay, so reoxidize lipoic acid on E2, reduce FAD to FADH2. And then that FADH2 can be reoxidized back to FAD via transferring those electrons to NAD plus to generate NADH. Okay? So in this case, FADH2 reoxidized to FAD, NAD plus reduced to NADH. And so effectively, what this happens is, is that Enzyme E1 and E2 cooperate to call what's referred to as oxidative alpha decarboxylation of pyruvate while adding CoA. So that's where you get acetyl CoA with reduction of lipoic acid in E2. And then E3 reoxidizes the lipoic acid in E2 while generating NADH. This NADH, once it's generated, of course, those electrons have to go somewhere. So like, like in glycolysis, it also needs to regenerate to NAD at some point. This is ultimately the electrons that end up on oxygen. And it's really this series of electron transfers with oxygen being a good electron acceptor that ultimately allows controlled energy release during carbon oxidation. And cells, you'll see, can use that to make ATP or do other kinds of work. OK. So the net reaction then, or another way to draw the pyruvate dehydrogenase reaction, would be as follows. And that's taking pyruvate. to acetyl-CoA, all right? And so we're going to take coenzyme A and release CO2. This is done by TPP plus as part of E1. That involves converting the lipoic acid in E2 from the oxidized to the reduced state. That lipoic acid then has to be reoxidized. If something's oxidized, something else has to be reduced. That's FAD on E3, which also then cycles between the oxidized and reduced state and ultimately, those electrons ended up being transferred 
to NAD plus to generate NADH. And so the PDH complex is basically a chain of electron transfer reactions. And it's the first example of a chain of electron transfer reactions. We're going to see that there is the electron transfer chain in the mitochondria effectively does the same thing. And by coupling oxidation and reduction reactions across chains of molecules like this, effectively, as a preview, allows the stepwise energy release of these oxidation reactions to occur. Um, so remember, if we burn glucose, completely oxidize it in one step, where those electrons are directly transferred to oxygen in combustion, lots of energy released, but all in one step. By doing these stepwise electron transfers, we can then basically break up that energy release in a way that it can be captured by cells to do work. Here, the way energy is captured, it's not so obvious in this electron transport reaction, but effectively, you're using oxidation of the ketone on pyruvate with decarboxylation to the acid to generate, rather than just the acid, a thioester bond, and that's that thioester bond, as well as NADH, that's energy as well, but it's really that thioester bond that then can be recaptured later to drive synthesis of citrate in the TCA cycle. All right. Now, next, what I want to do is I want to discuss the TCA cycle reactions. Now that you see how you can get acetyl-CoA, at least from pyruvate, I want to discuss how you can now use that acetyl-CoA and oxidize it back to uh, combine it with um, oxaloacetate and oxidize it back uh, to, to make citrate and then oxidize it back to oxaloacetate to, to run the, the uh, TCA cycle. OK, great. So the first reaction. the TCA cycle. Here's acetyl-CoA. It will combine with oxaloacetate. This reaction is catalyzed by an enzyme called citrate synthase. And generates the 6-carbon tricarboxylic acid citrate. OK. So how does this reaction work? Here's drawing acetyl-CoA in a slightly different way. If I redraw this as the enol, 
this will generate Citrate via effectively that mechanism. Okay. Next, citrate is converted by adding water across this carbon carbon or by removing water across this carbon-carbon bond to generate this intermediate called cis-aconitate. Intermediate is called cis conitate. So all I did was dehydrate across that bond. So there's a double bond there. And then if I re add water across that bond, I generate this. molecule called isocitrate. So effectively, to convert citrate to isocitrate, I'm moving the hydroxyl group from that carbon to this carbon. To do that, I basically dehydrate, make a double bond, remove water, re-add water across that bond in the opposite direction to generate this molecule, isocitrate. This reaction is carried out by an enzyme called aconitase and convert citrate to isocitrate. I think it's a little easier to see this reaction if I draw it a slightly different way. So this here is just drawing citrate by just slightly rotating the molecule to look like that. And so I'm basically removing water here 
like that. Okay, and then I'm now just adding water back in the opposite orientation. To generate iso citrate. Now, you'll notice when I drew this, if you look at citrate, this is actually a symmetrical molecule. So the top half and the bottom half of citrate are identical. And so what's interesting about nature is that it treats these carbons, the green carbons that came from acetyl-CoA, different from the side of the molecule that comes from oxaloacetate. And effectively, nature always moves the hydroxyl group to this carbon that came from oxaloacetate and never moves it to this carbon that came from um, acetyl-CoA. This is an example where enzymes, nature, treats a symmetrical molecule like citrate in an asymmetrical way. And this has consequences for how carbon is actually traced through the entire TCA cycle. Because even though you might think things could get scrambled at citrate, they never do. Meaning in isocitrate, it's always these green carbons that came from acetyl-CoA. You never get those green carbons on the other side of isocitrate. Um, and so when we go through the TCA cycle, I'll keep these carbons green until the point where you can no longer distinguish which carbon came from, came from which reaction. Okay, the next reaction is we're going to oxidize this carbon of isocitrate. So if we're gonna oxidize that carbon, those electrons have to go somewhere. And so if we oxidize the carbon, we can use NAD plus as an electron acceptor, reduce it to um, NADH. That generates this intermediate. This is clear to everybody at this point, but just in case. So this carbon here in isocitrate, if I oxidize that alcohol to the ketone, now I generate a hydride ion. Those two electrons on the hydride can go to NAD plus and reduce it to NADH. That generates this intermediate. It's called oxalosuccinate, which then, if you notice that oxalosuccinate is now, this is a beta keto acid. So alpha, beta, the acid group is beta to the ketone, so it's a beta keto acid. 
remember, beta decarboxylation is favorable, and so I can lose that CO2, and what I'm left with is This molecule, which is called alpha keto glutarate. So, this whole reaction here, the oxidation of the alcohol to the ketone, followed by beta decarboxylation of oxalosuccinate to alpha ketoglutarate. Is carried out by an enzyme called isocitrate dehydrogenase. And of course, just to remind you, here's that beta um, keto acid in oxalosuccinate. And so that can decarboxylate, leading this enol, which can, of course, rearrange back to the ketone. That we see in alpha ketoglutarate. Now, if you look at alpha ketoglutarate, you'll notice that, and I will redraw over here. This here is just me redrawing alpha ketoglutarate, which is often abbreviated alpha KG. Just drew it as a straight line. Now, if you'll notice, alpha ketoglutarate is a alpha keto acid. And so here the acid group is alpha to the ketone, so an alpha keto acid. It's effectively just like pyruvate, but has this additional pieces on it. And it turns out the next step in the TCA cycle is the exact reaction that we saw with pyruvate dehydrogenase. It's alpha decarboxylation, oxidative alpha keto acid decarboxylation. as follows. So we carry out This is a molecule called succinyl CoA. And so you'll see what happened there is decarboxylated here, this carbon, while oxidizing this ketone to the acid and adding CoA. That's a redox reaction, so NADNADH. Turns out this is exactly the same mechanism 
So I don't need to draw it again that I just showed you for pyruvate dehydrogenase. So it needs all the same cofactors, TPP plus, lipoic acid, FAD. And in fact, it even shares some of the same enzyme complexes, subunits, as pyruvate dehydrogenase. And so this is a reaction that's catalyzed by alpha ketoglutarate dehydrogenase, like pyruvate dehydrogenase. This is a complex. And so it has a unique E1, which makes sense. Remember, E1 of pyruvate dehydrogenase was actually the subunit that bound the pyruvate. E1 of alpha-ketoglutarate dehydrogenase is unique. It binds alpha-ketoglutarate instead of pyruvate. However, they share the same E2 and E3s. And so the E2s and E3s would carry out exactly the same reaction and play the same part in the mechanism of how you do this um, alpha oxidative alpha decarboxylation to turn alpha-ketoglutarate into um, succinyl-CoA. Now, remember in pyruvate dehydrogenase, once we got that acetyl CoA, we then used this CoA group to drive condensation with citrate. Well, in this case, what happens is you don't want to combine um, condensation here. Instead, what is going to happen is you want to use this CoA group to now generate um, ATP. And so this is going to couple release of the CoA to generate an ATP equivalent. It's actually GTP that's generated by the TCA cycle. And so this is going to generate this molecule succinate. And the enzyme that does this is called succinic thiokinase. Okay. So let's go through over here how this enzyme works. So here's succinyl CoA. basically using favorable loss of the CoA, breaking the thioester bond to to generate this acid anhydride. We saw an acid anhydride before in um, Glycolysis, remember we made 1,3-bisphosphoglycerate. So that's a good phosphate donor. And then that can be used to generate succinate and transferring that phosphate to GDP to make GTP, just like 1,3-bisphosphoglycerate um, was able to transfer the phosphate from the acid anhydride to ATP, ADP to make ATP. Um, in glycolysis. OK. So the next step is to oxidize this carbon-carbon bond in succinate. So if we're going to oxidize a carbon-carbon bond, those electrons have to go somewhere. All right. So. So there's our carbon-carbon bond. And so if we will generate hydride ion, just like we did in other oxidation reactions, but this hydride ion is transferred not to NAD, but instead to 
FAD, a different electron carrier, to generate FADH2. Now, I should point out, succinate, like citrate, is a symmetrical molecule. But at this point, nature doesn't tell the difference. Once it generates succinate, this molecule now gets scrambled. And so everything downstream of succinate, you no longer know which carbons came from acetyl-CoA. This generates this molecule called fumarate. And this reaction is carried out by an enzyme called succinate dehydrogenase. Often abbreviated SDH for succinate dehydrogenase. All right, now the next reaction is we're going to add water across this double bond of fumarate. And that generates this intermediate, malate. This reaction is carried out by an enzyme called fumarate hydratase. And it's simply adding a water molecule across that double bond. Once we have malate, if you look, what's the difference between malate and oxaloacetate? The difference is that in oxaloacetate, this carbon is a ketone, whereas in malate, it's an alcohol. And so if we want to turn this carbon from the alcohol into the ketone, that is, of course, a oxidation reaction. And so Those electrons have to go somewhere. Don't need to draw the mechanism again. It's basically just the hydride transfer to oxidize this to an alcohol to the ketone. That oxidation couples to reduction of NAD plus to NADH. This is carried out by an enzyme called malate D. Hydrogenase. And doing this completes the TCA cycle, regenerating an oxaloacetate that can then recombine with another acetyl CoA to go through another round of the cycle. You'll notice that going through this cycle, there's two CO2s lost. One of them is lost here at the isocitrate to alpha ketoglutarate reaction. So this decarboxylation from oxalosuccinate to alpha ketoglutarate, that beta decarboxylation, that's the first CO2. The other one is lost here at the alpha ketoglutarate the alpha ketoglutarate dehydrogenase step, where you have this alpha decarboxylation to take alpha ketoglutarate to succinyl-CoA, oxidative alpha decarboxylation. Now, what's cool about this is you notice we just discussed all the reactions of the TCA cycle. And I showed you, reminded you, of some chemistry that you've already seen. 
But unless you count the chemistry we showed you earlier for how the PDH and alpha-ketoglutarate dehydrogenase reactions work with E1, E2, and E3 with lipoic acid FAD, that was obviously new for today. But other than that, everything else was chemistry that you've already seen. And this really points out the point that I made earlier, that metabolism is really variations on relatively few reactions. We've just repurposed some of the same tricks, if you will, that were used in glycolysis and allowed it to now do an entire different pathway, the TCA cycle. It also points out how Hans Krebs was, while it's still remarkable, able to figure out from chemistry alone because there's actually quite a bit of logic to the way metabolism works. Now, I want to say this again. Note there were two carbons that entered, acetyl-CoA, and two carbons that were lost as CO2. But if you look, the green carbons remain in the same places until they get to succinate. And so the two carbons that enter are not lost on the first turn of the cycle. It's actually two carbons that came from alpha-ketoglutarate that are, I mean, from oxaloacetate that are converted to CO2 as that acetyl-CoA goes through the cycle. And so to oxidize the exact carbons from acetyl-CoA to CO2 requires more than one turn of the cycle. You'll also notice that the cycle is oxidation. And so oxidation reactions, of course, release energy. We've talked about that. And so it's favorable. And the products, if you will, are three NADH molecules. You can say plus one more NADH if we're going all the way from glucose or from pyruvate, glucose derived pyruvate, because the pyruvate dehydrogenase reaction also generates an NADH to make that acetyl CoA. One FADH2, as well as one GTP molecule. And so Lots of oxidation going on here. We completely oxidize two carbons to CO2, so that's energy released. But you notice you only get one GTP from the molecule. Now, this GTP, of course, that reaction, the succinic thiokinase reaction, like the reactions we saw in glycolysis, is such that it can generate GTP at a high GTP-GDP ratio or ATP-ADP ratio. Remember, those are equivalent. Those energy charges are similar. And so that makes sense, but most of the energy released is actually reducing NAD and FAD to NADH and FADH2. And of course, these need to transfer their electrons somewhere else, and that's the role of oxygen. Now, oxygen, remember, is a very good electron donor, and so it's the ultimate transfer of those electrons from these molecules to oxygen that also provide energy that the cell can use to do work, but it does so in a way by charging up different ratios in the cell. So the NAD-NADH or the FADH2, FAD ratios. And just like we talked about the ratio or the energy of ATP is in the interconversion between ATP and ADP, it's the ratio that drives the free energy change. The same thing exists for NADH and NAD, FADH2 and FAD. And so charging up these ratios while passing through the TCA cycle and the ultimate downstream transfer of those electrons to oxygen really is where most of the energy is captured as carbon is oxidized through, through the TCA cycle. And exactly how that works and how it can be related to um, ATP will be something that will be more explicit in the coming lectures. Now, I want to point out, apart from the oxidation, there's actually lots of intermediates made here. And it turns out a bunch of these intermediates are useful for cells to make stuff. So we talked about gluconeogenesis. Gluconeogenesis needs electron balance. We get NADH from the TCA cycle. And so you can think of you know, gluconeogenesis as an alternative to fermentation to dispose of electrons. We can use the NADH from the TCA cycle to run gluconeogenesis as well. But beyond the cofactors, the carbon itself. So citrate, I've alluded to now a few times, is important as a free precursor to make fat. We'll discuss that in later lectures too. But other intermediates in this pathway 
are useful for various amino acids and nucleic acids. And so there's lots of things that can come from the TCA cycle that cells can find useful to do not just catabolism, but also anabolic processes. Now, the way the TCA cycle works, though, is that there's actually an issue if you want to use the intermediates from the TCA cycle to make stuff. And so what is that issue? Well, the TCA cycle functions at a as a cycle. And so if we're going to take things in and out of it, that has consequences for how the cycle runs. Now, there's a couple words for this that I want to just introduce to you. The first one is catapleurosis, and the second one is anapleurosis. And so catapleurosis is the act of removing stuff from a metabolic cycle. So we're going to remove citrate from the cycle to make fat. That's catapleurosis. Anapleurosis is adding stuff back to a metabolic cycle so it can continue to function. Viewing this is really evident if you think of the TCA cycle as a chicken and egg problem. So the very first time acetyl-CoA was generated, how do you start the TCA cycle in the first place? You can't add it to the TCA cycle unless you have oxaloacetate to combine with the acetyl-CoA, which can then generate another acetyl oxaloacetate. So where does the first oxaloacetate come from? Well, we already talked about one reaction. We talked about it in the context of gluconeogenesis that can solve this problem. And so we have pyruvate. And so we talked earlier today how we can do oxidative decarboxylation of pyruvate to give acetyl-CoA. But we talked in the gluconeogenesis lecture how we can add a CO2 to pyruvate to generate oxaloacetate. So if I do those two reactions, now I have all the carbon I need to generate a citrate and start off the TCA cycle. Now, obviously, if I do catapleurosis and I remove that citrate I made to make fat, well, now I need to pyruvate again to generate the next citrate if I'm using this pathway. Because every time I bring an acetyl-CoA into the cycle, I need an oxaloacetate to combine it with. And so if I remove something, I have to add something back. And so pyruvate to oxaloacetate, the pyruvate carboxylase reaction, is an example of an anaplerotic reaction. Now, what this means, though, is that in order to do anaplerosis, you have to be able to generate 4-carbon oxaloacetate, or a 4-carbon molecule. Now, pyruvate carboxylase, pyruvate to oxaloacetate, allows you to do that. We can take a 3-carbon molecule and generate 4-carbon oxaloacetate. However, if we start from a 2-carbon molecule, like acetate, or acetyl-CoA that enters the cycle, it's actually not so simple to take that 2-carbon molecule and turn it into 4-carbon oxaloacetate. And in fact, humans lack any enzymes that allow them to take a 2-carbon unit, to take acetate or acetyl-CoA, and turn it into anything that's longer than net, turn it into anything that's longer than 2 carbons. And this has important implications for human physiology. Because what it says is, is that we can't make glucose from anything that starts with something less than 3 carbons long. So if you drink alcohol and you metabolize that alcohol to acetate, or it turns out you take fat and you break down fat also to acetyl-CoA to acetate, two carbons long, there is no way to turn that mo those molecules into glucose because you cannot generate the oxaloacetate to do the anaplerosis that's necessary to get it there. <clears throat> 
what this means is, is that our body can only store calories that come from two carbon units, fat or alcohol, as fat. We can never turn them back into glucose um, or make glycogen. And this is very relevant for those of you who go to medical school because it's relevant to our physiology. And that is when our bodies exhaust all of our stores of glucose, what happens? Our liver can no longer do gluconeogenesis. And so what happens? Now it has to switch over to doing something else. It has to work with two carbon units. And ultimately, this is ketone metabolism, which we'll talk about in a few lectures. It also said that the body, um, that this is also of the basis of a very old adage that's out there that some of you may have heard that you need to have some other fuel if you're going to burn fat. The basis for that is, is that fat is turned into two carbon units, acetyl-CoA units. And so if you're going to take those acetyl-CoA units and ultimately burn them away, turn them into CO2, you need a source of oxaloacetate or your TCA cycle won't work. Now you don't need a lot of something, but it is true, you can't start just with acetyl-CoA as a human and turn it into CO2. So you need some, at least a little bit of oxaloacetate to get your TCA cycle started. Now, that's a problem that we as face as humans and other mammals face, but it turns out there's lots of microbes out there that grow just fine on acetate or on alcohol, even if it's the only carbon source. And so those organisms must have some way to build stuff from two carbon units. That is a way to use two carbon units and do anaplerosis. And it turns out the way they do this is via something called the glyoxalate cycle. And so the glyoxalate cycle is an alternative version of the TCA cycle that effectively uses two enzymes that we lack as mammals. And so I'll quickly tell you about it here. And so this here is So this is isocitrate from the TCA cycle. And some microbes have an enzyme called isocitrate lyase. And what isocitrate lyase does is basically splits isocitrate in half, such that the top portion of the molecule is another TCA cycle intermediate, succinate. And the bottom portion of a molecule is this two carbon aldehyde called glyoxalate. Glyoxalate can react with acetyl-CoA by another enzyme that we lack as humans called malate synthase. And I don't have time to show the mechanism again but malate synthase basically adds the two carbons from acetyl-CoA to the aldehyde, to the ketone, or the, the, the carbonyl, the aldehyde carbonyl of glyoxalate in a reaction that is, for all intents and purposes, exactly what happens in citrate synthase that will generate This molecule, which is malate, also in the TCA cycle. And so having these two extra reactions, isocitrate lyase and malate synthase, gives microbes the ability to have acetyl-CoA be anaplerotic. And so how does that work? Well, that's because we can start with, if we start with on oxaloacetate, four carbons, an acetyl-CoA, two carbons, 
could run the TCA cycle and make citrate, six carbons, turn that citrate into iso citrate, use isocitrate lyase to generate glyoxylate, two carbons, plus succinate. That succinate can run through succinate dehydrogenase to generate malate, which can go through malate dehydrogenase to generate oxaloacetate. This glyoxylate can start with a second acetyl-CoA, two carbons come together, generate malate. That generates a second malate molecule, which can then exit the cycle as malate or oxaloacetate or whatever you want. And so basically it allows two acetyl-CoAs to net generate an oxaloacetate, and so net generates a way to do anaplerosis from two carbon units by having this malate um, uh, synthase reaction and this isocitrate lyase reaction and run this alternative version of the TCA, TCA cycle called the glyoxylate cycle. And it's a nice way how life, again, no new chemistry here, just variations on what we've already shown, repurpose the similar chemistries that it's already using as a way to live off of only two, car two carbon, um, carbon sources that contain only two carbons, like ethanol or acetate. All right, so in closing today, the last thing I want to talk about very briefly is how the TCA cycle is regulated. And we don't need to spend a ton of time on this because it really follows principles that make sense, particularly when we think about things that we've already talked about. And so the regulation of the TCA cycle is, of course, important, and it's really a critical hub both for anabolic and catabolic pathways. So you needed to get energy to fully oxidize carbon, but it's also a useful place to get stuff. And before I talk about regulation, I just want to point out that many of the enzymes of the TCA cycle, even though we talk about it in the mitochondria and we're about to talk about regulation in terms of catabolism, that is oxidation ways to release energy, many of these enzymes are also in other locations in the cell because there's functions for them in making stuff that is very different than what goes on in the TCA cycle. And the regulation that I'll tell you about and that is, comes up on MCAT exams and stuff like that usually talks about this pathway as a catabolic pathway, as a way to make CO2, to make ATP. However, recognize that there's also variations on this pathway that can use in anabolic things, making stuff, and that regulation is something that really is not necessarily what we're going to talk about here and is a little bit less well understood. But at least the regulation in terms of catabolism, if we put it in context of glucose metabolism, so here's glycolysis turning glucose into pyruvate. And then that pyruvate can operate through the pyruvate dehydrogenase reaction to generate acetyl-CoA. That acetyl-CoA can combine with oxaloacetate to generate citrate. That citrate, of course, can be used to generate fat, as we've talked about. That can go to isocitrate, isocitrate to alpha ketoglutarate. That's catalyzed by isocitrate dehydrogenase, which I will abbreviate IDH, alpha ketoglutarate to succinate, more correctly to 
succinyl CoA by alpha ketoglutarate dehydrogenase alpha KG DH and then this back to oxaloacetate. And so the main enzymes that are typically discussed as being regulated are alpha ketoglutarate dehydrogenase, isocitrate dehydrogenase, and pyruvate dehydrogenase. I also drew glycolysis, and I'll just write over here gluconeogenesis up here because we can now see more fully how this plays in with citrate acting as a positive regulator of gluconeogenesis and an inhibitor of glycolysis. Again, if you're full in citrate, stop running glycolysis, start running gluconeogenesis. Now, the other regulation, if you have a lot of acetyl-CoA, stop making it from pyruvate. Acetyl-CoA is a negative regulator of PDH. This is carbon oxidation, generates, releases a lot of energy, generates a lot of ATP, generates a lot of NADH. If you have lots of those things, no reason to keep sending carbon into acetyl-CoA to go into the TCA cycle. Ultimately, we have to send those electrons somewhere. So if there's nowhere to put them, low oxygen also inhibits pyruvate dehydrogenase. And of course, if you need more energy, if ADP is high, that activates pyruvate dehydrogenase. So at least in terms of glucose, complete glucose oxidation, a lot of regulation happens at pyruvate dehydrogenase, and a lot of it really makes sense. High levels of ATP, high levels of NADH, also inhibit isocitrate dehydrogenase and alpha ketoglutarate dehydrogenase. Makes sense. Succinyl CoA, high. Inhibit alpha ketoglutarate dehydrogenase, high levels of ADP, need to release more energy, activate alpha ketoglutarate dehydrogenase. Again, these are the feedbacks that people talk about on board exams. Good to know, but you can almost guess what they would be from first principles. Because remember, this is a pathway that releases a lot of energy, high energy, high ATP, high NADH. Don't run the cycle. Don't enter carbon in the cycle. Low energy, high ATP, or sorry, high ADP. Put carbon in the cycle. Run the cycle faster. Makes sense. Also makes sense of the reciprocal regulation of glycolysis and gluconeogenesis. Okay, great. Next time, we will talk more about how we can oxidize fatty acids, fat, um, by accessing acetyl-CoA and entering it into the cycle. Thanks.